Thank you, Professor, for the introduction. Um, I'm Sam, and I'm going to present our paper, Performing TCP for Low Power Wireless Networks. Uh, this is joint work with Michael Anderson, Hyung Sun Kim, and David Culler. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about existing research in low power wireless personal area networks, or LOPANs, in order to put our work in context. So research on LOPANs began in the late 1990s, and at this point, researchers deliberately cast away the internet architecture based on the idea that LOPANs might be too different and too extreme for it to directly apply. So uh, various protocols and systems that were highly, highly influential in this space were developed. Uh, without conforming to any particular standard or architecture, but nicely ha tackling the various challenges of LOPANs. Um, about 10 years later, the Internet Protocol was introduced in this space, largely enabled by the 6 LOPAN adaptation layer. And what happened here is that researchers found ways to take the techniques that had been developed earlier and adapt them to work within the Internet architecture. And this basically caught on. So in four to five years, IP had essentially become the standard. And nowadays, everyone uses IP in LOPANs. Uh, but surprisingly, the adoption of IP in this space did not include TCP. So, for example, OpenThread, uh, a low-pan network stack recently open sourced by Nest, doesn't even support TCP. And instead, the direction the community has taken has been to standardize specialized UDP-based protocols like CoAP. Um, and uh, meanwhile, low-pans still haven't gained the same kind of mainstream adoption as other wireless protocols like Wi-Fi. So a natural question is whether we should also consider including TCP and more broadly the family of IP-based protocols as well along with IP. So in that context, our work completes the transition of LOPANs to an IP-based architecture by showing how to make TCP work well in LOPANs. And what do I mean by work well? Well, one particular metric is the achievable good put over TCP, which is the, which is the throughput achievable by applications over a TCP session. And there have been a few prior attempts in this space to use TCP, typically using uh, simplified embedded TCP stacks like MicroIP or Blip. And in contrast, we were able to achieve significantly higher TCP good put in these applications. And in fact, we can calculate an upper bound based on how fast the radio is able to send out packets and the overheads of headers and acts and so on. And our work, in fact, comes pretty close to this theoretical upper bound. So that's a preview of our work. Now I'm going to step back and talk a little bit about exactly what are LOPANs to give some more background. And I'm going to explain that by comparing them to other kinds of networks that you might be more familiar with. So Wi-Fi provides a host with internet connectivity via an access point. Uh, Bluetooth is more like a cable replacement channel, a wireless USB of sorts. And in contrast, a LOPAN aims to provide connectivity like Wi-Fi to various embedded devices and is subject to the constraints of operating at low power, like, for example, operating over multiple wireless hops and so on, as I'll elaborate a little bit later. Uh, so low pans are useful for a variety of applications, scientific applications like environmental monitoring and structural monitoring, and also in indoor environments. So, for example, there's recently been a commercial push to integrate low pan technology into the smart home and IoT space. Uh, but despite being useful for all these applications, they also come with a variety of challenges. Um, so the first challenge are the resource constraints of the hosts, in that the host devices in a low pen typically have much more limited CPU and memory than host devices in other kinds of networks. Uh, the energy constraints of the hosts also play a role. Uh, in particular, the hosts in these networks typically don't even have enough energy to keep their radios on and listening all the time, so you have to duty cycle the radio. And what that means is that you have to keep the radio off almost all the time, like say 99% of the time, and then Rarely, like 1% of the time, you turn on the radio, and only then you can receive packets. And because we still want to provide an always-on illusion to applications using these networks, we need some scheduling at the link layer in order to manage when these radios are on and when packets are sent. Um, and finally, uh, the link layer has to make some compromises in order to operate at low power. In particular, it has a much lower MTU, an order of magnitude smaller than Ethernet or Wi-Fi. And furthermore, a low power implies low wireless range, which means that over a large network, you need to send data over multiple wireless hops to bring connectivity to all these devices. So to make this concrete, um, our research was, uh, so in our research, we used devices based on a Hamilton sensor platform. And uh, the key takeaway here is that a device like this is a little more powerful than the early devices in the early days of low pan research, but still significantly less powerful than, say, a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can't run Linux on a device like this. You'd have to run a specialized embedded operating system. And 
Our research addresses the central question of how a device like this should connect to the internet. And our proposal is to use TCP IP. Now, as I mentioned, the adoption of IP in this space did not come along with the adoption of TCP, and that was no accident. Uh, research deliberately steered clear of TCP due to a variety of concerns around TCP that made researchers expect it to perform poorly. Uh, some of these concerns are that TCP might be too heavy for these low power devices, um, that TCP's features, in particular its connection-oriented abstraction, aren't really necessary and just bring additional overhead. And finally, the classic problem of wireless TCP, that it interprets wireless losses as congestion and therefore might perform poorly. So what we did is that we actually ran TCP in a low band to see what would happen. And we found that out of the box, TCP does perform poorly, but not for these expected reasons. Um, the actual reasons that we observed are that the small MTU provided by, uh, provided by low bands results in high header overhead, that hidden terminals are a serious issue for TCP over multiple wireless hops, and finally, that out of the box, TCP does not play well with the kind of link layer scheduling you need to maintain a low duty cycle. So there's actually a significant difference between these two sets of reasons. The ones on the left, if they were to exist, would largely be fundamental problems that can't easily be mitigated. Whereas the problems on the right, as we show, are actually fixable via fairly straightforward techniques within the paradigm of a TCP-based architecture. So in our work, we show how to address these issues that actually cause poor performance. We show why the expected reasons don't actually apply. And our overall conclusion is that TCP can perform well in low pans after all. So that's an overview of the overall talk. Now I'm going to move on to the expected reason for poor performance and why they don't apply. So this relies on our empirical measurements, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about our implementation of TCP. And as I mentioned, there have been a few other efforts earlier on to run TCP, but they typically use simplified TCP implementations. In contrast, we want to use the full-scale TCP implementation for our study. Uh, now one challenge here is that Building a full-field TCP implementation is hard. In fact, there's a whole RFC devoted to all the bugs people were seeing in, the, in 1999 in full-scale TCP implementations. So rather than building a TCP implementation from scratch, our approach was to begin with the mature full-scale TCP implementation in FreeBSD, and then re-engineer key parts of it in order to work well on our embedded platform. Uh, we call the resulting implementation TCP-LP, where the LP stands for low power. OK, so now that we have a concrete implementation of TCP, we can ask the question, is TCP too heavy for these low power embedded devices? Uh, what we find is that the TCP protocol itself requires about 32 kilobytes of compiled code and about half a kilobyte of RAM per connection, which fits comfortably within the amount of ROM and RAM available on the actual embedded platform we were working with. But this is only the actual connection state itself. The natural question is, OK, what about the TCP buffers? Uh, so we'd like to size our buffers so that we're able to fill the bandwidth delay product. And we empirically measured a bandwidth delay product in a low band to be about two to three kilobytes. Uh, so for example, here, as we vary the buffer size, we can see that the TCP good put kind of levels off around two to three kilobytes. And two to three kilobytes also fits comfortably within memory. So our overall conclusion here is that TCP, including its buffers, actually fits comfortably within memory on these constrained devices. OK, so now I'm going to move on to the next concern, which is the wireless TCP problem, TCP interpreting uh, wireless losses as being due to congestion. Uh, and to do that, we can ask how many in-flight TCP segments we have in a single connection, uh, which is kind of the central problem here. Um, the bandwidth delay product from before is about 2 to 3 kilobytes. And we size each segment to be uh, between 250 bytes and 500 bytes. And this was done carefully. Uh, we use a six low pan adaptation layer to fragment our packets to get around the MTU limit. And the paper develops how we, how we got these numbers. Um, the, overall, uh, the overall point I want to make here is that uh, this means that you have four to 12 in-flight TCP segments per connection. And this is much lower than the number of in-flight segments you have over higher bandwidth links, such, such as Wi-Fi and so on. And this actually really affects how TCP's congestion control behaves in this setting. So if you look at how TCP New Reno behaves in a low pan, in a setting where you have four segments in your BDP, you get a graph that looks like this, where sure, the losses are happening pretty frequently, but because your BDP is small, the congestion window is able to recover to the BDP very quickly, and you're actually spending most of your time transmitting at a full window. Um, 
A more challenging setting is one where you have smaller size segments and are also using random early drops, which may induce a few more losses. And in that case, we see a graph that's more reminiscent of the canonical sawtooth curve, but the, but the congestion window is still able to recover pretty quickly from packet loss, and you still spend a significant amount of time operating at a full window. Uh, so our overall observation here is that the congestion window is able to recover to the bandwidth delay product quickly because the BDP is small. And as a result, TCP in a low pan is more resilient to wireless losses than it might be in other kinds of wireless networks that operate at higher bandwidth. Now I'm going to move on to addressing the actual reasons for poor performance. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on in the talk, you can kind of classify the various constraints of low pans into three categories, resource constraints, energy constraints, and link layer constraints. And for each one, we have a couple of techniques that we use in order to, uh, in order to address some of the problems. Uh, so the first two have to do with how you manage memory within the TCP stack in order to minimize the memory footprint of TCP buffering. Uh, the next two, adaptive duty cycle and link layer queue management, have to do with how you deal with operating a radio at low duty cycle. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, a typical maximum segment size has to deal with how we get around the low MTU in the space, and link retry delay is how we deal with hidden terminals. Uh, the talk is going to go more in depth into these two techniques, though the remaining techniques are described in the paper. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how duty cycling works in order to, in order to explain our work here. So, as I mentioned earlier, hosts in this space often don't have enough energy to keep their radios on and listening all the time. So we define the duty cycle as the proportion of time that the radio is listening or transmitting. And we want to have a low duty cycle since that would imply low power. Uh, there are various techniques that have been developed in the sensornet literature about how to operate a low duty cycle. OpenThread, which is a network stack that we used in our research, makes a particular choice. It uses a, what's called a receiver-initiated duty cycle protocol, which I will explain. So in OpenThread, you have two kinds of nodes. You have battery-powered nodes where you want to duty cycle the radio, and some wall-powered nodes that have enough power to keep their radio on and listening all the time. OK, so sending a packet here from B, which is a battery-powered node, to W, which is a wall-powered node, is actually not too difficult because uh, W's radio is always on. You can just send it at any time. OK, what's more challenging is sending the packet from W to B. And what happens here is that if W has a frame to send, it can't just send it right away. Instead, it has to wait until B turns on his radio and is listening before it can safely send the packet. Uh, so the way the protocol handles this is that when B turns on its radio to listen, it'll send W a data request packet so that it knows that B is listening. And then once W knows that B is listening, it can go ahead and send the frame to B. So the point here is that B's idle duty cycle is determined by how frequently it sends these data request packets. For example, if it sends the data request packets very rarely, then B operates at a low radio duty cycle, but the, but the downside of that is that it sees higher latency when it receives the packets. OK, so that's how the radio duty cycling works. Now, how does this actually affect TCP? Right? And to do that, we compared HTTP over TCP to CoAP. And CoAP is a specialized REST protocol for low pen devices that operates over UDP. Uh, and our setup was that uh, in the idle case, B will send W a data request frame every 1,000 milliseconds, so once every second, which will keep it at a pretty low duty cycle. Um, the key difference between HTTP and CoAP is that HTTP requires two round trips, one to set up a TCP session and then one to actually send the request in response, whereas CoAP only requires one round trip. And I know there are some ways in HTTP you can kind of get around the two round trips in protocol compliant ways, for example, by sending some beta along with your SYN. But in the interest of keeping this fair compared to what actual HTTP implementations in the wild do, uh, we kept the comparison this way. And what we observe is that if you compare out of the box the performance of CoAP and HTTP, you find that HTTP performs significantly worse, more than just twice as bad. And what's happening is that on the first round trip, you see half of the 1,000 milliseconds as you might expect. But then the second round trip sees kind of worst case timing consistently. Because what's happening is that the round trip starts right at the beginning of the duty cycle. So you see the full 1,000 milliseconds on the second round trip. Uh, and that's kind of because TCP is an act clock protocol. This actually happens over higher throughput flows as well. Um, so our solution here is to use an adaptive radio duty cycle where we use the internal protocol state of HTTP over TCP to adapt when we send these data request messages. So in particular, if you're an HTTP sensor node in one of these networks and you receive 
a SYN packet, you accept a TCP connection, you can be pretty sure that you're going to receive an HTTP request over the connection pretty soon. So what we do is we send the data request messages more frequently at that moment in anticipation of receiving another packet. And once we do this, we're able to, uh, we're able to almost completely mask the additional latency that HTTP would normally see compared to co-op. Okay, so that handles the duty cycle link in our network between a battery powered node and a wall powered node. But an open thread network overall actually consists of other nodes as well in the network that are wall powered. And over these multiple wireless hops, we observe a high packet loss rate due to hidden terminals. Now some background here is that over Wi-Fi, it's common to use an RTS-CTS protocol in order to mitigate hidden terminals. But in the context of low pans, you typically don't use such protocols because a small MTU would make its overhead prohibitive. Um, so uh, what we do instead is we, we add a delay in the link layer. So if a transmission fails, as in there's no link layer acknowledgement, we wait a random amount before retrying the transmission. And this is different from CSMA because we aren't delaying based on an assessment of whether the channel is busy or not. We're delaying based on whether the previous transmission succeeded. Um, and as we increase the delay, what we see is that the segment loss goes down, but for moderate to small delays, the TCP good put isn't actually affected very much by it. So using this technique, we're able to significantly decrease the packet loss rate over multiple wireless hops to mitig and mitigate hidden terminals. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the final part of the talk. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier on, um, we're able to use a link efficiently. So TCP, uh, so RTCP implementation achieves a higher good put significantly than much of the prior work in this space. And furthermore, you can compute an upper bound on the achievable good put. So you can look at the overheads within the radio and the link layer itself. Then you can add on the overheads due to headers, TCP acts, and so on. And we're able to achieve within 25% of a theoretical upper bound calculated that way. Um, additionally, we use energy efficiently. So we use TCP and co-op for a sense and send task measured, and we measure the radio duty cycle over a 24 hour period. And the graph looks something like this. Uh, the key point here is that TCP is not performing significantly worse than co-op as many of the, uh, as may have been thought earlier on. Um, and in fact, both TCP and co-op have a radio duty cycle of around 2%. Um, so now that TCP is a viable option, what does this mean for network systems in the space? Well, the first thing is that we should reconsider using lightweight protocols that emulate part of TCP's functionality, like co-app, and instead we should use TCP in cases where it performs as well or almost as well as these alternatives. Um, TCP may also influence how we design these systems as a whole. So one design that's actually really popular now in commercial offerings is to use is this gateway-based design, where you have an application layer gateway at the edge of the network that is performing application-specific functionality to bring connectivity to devices. Uh, TCP gives us the opportunity to rethink that gateway-based architecture and instead replace the gateway with an IP-based border router instead, which would in turn allow for better interoperability between different manufacturers' ecosystems. Finally, I'd like to mention that UDP-based protocols will probably still have a place in low pans, but one more similar to their role in the rest of the internet, where particular applications that need or would benefit significantly from finer grain control over their transport can use TCP whereas TCP uh, can use UDP, uh, whereas TCP will be used in the common case. So in summary, we implement TCP LP, a full-scale TCP stack for low pants. We explain why the expected reasons for poor TCP performance don't apply. We show how to address the actual reasons for poor TCP performance. And our overall conclusion is that TCP can perform comparably to low band specialized protocols. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Hi, this is Ish from UC San Diego. Uh, very interesting talk and very good insights that you have given. I have two very connected questions. One, when you talk about low power wireless, how much low power in terms of battery life that you improve uh, on these kind of sensors? And second thing, if you really want low power, then uh, why do you need the TCP on these sensors? Like there are certain sensor applications where sensors send very sparsely, like one packet in one hour. So there, if they only implement IP and the gateway which can handle multiple of these sensors can implement the control, uh, congestion control. So what kind of applications that will be enabled uh, by these kind of tags? Okay, so um, I'll start with 
your, um, so I'll start with your first question about, uh, about the overall power consumption. So it's hard, to, it's hard to give a single answer to what kind of power do you expect because it largely depends on the particular application. Um, I'd like to mention that the transition from other protocols to TCP, we, we don't expect to actually improve power consumption at all as much as match what the existing protocols provide. Uh, the specific 2% number that I had earlier on in the talk was for, um, was for an application that's making one measurement every one second. And I mean, you're absolutely right that there are also applications that send more sparsely. We chose that particular application because if I'm going to benchmark transport protocols, I want one that actually uses it quite a bit. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that there might be some applications still that, that still use UDP. Uh, the main advantage of TCP is, is for interoperability between different manufacturers' ecosystems, as I mentioned. Um, if you do have some specialized environmental sensing application that's sending data very rarely, then, uh, then maybe it doesn't make sense to use TCP all the time. I will point out that one of the results from our work is that whether you use UDP or TCP, uh, you get a significant amount of energy saving just by batching data, right? So if you batch your data, then there isn't as much of a case for using UDP anymore because if you batch enough readings, it does become kind of a high throughput stream, at least for a small duration to send that batch. So uh, do you have any application in mind, for example, like live video streaming or any such application? So, 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 so we were thinking along the lines of video streaming. Uh, we were thinking along the lines of maybe smart home use cases. Mm -hmm. And one application that we, that we elaborate a little more on in the paper is an anemometry use case, where you want to look at airflow in a building. And in that case, you do have a sensor that is sending at higher throughput than maybe some of the applications that you're referring to. Okay. Um, yeah. So maybe Thank we have you. time for one more question. Um, hi, I'm Swaran Kumar from Carnegie Mellon. Great talk. Uh, very quick question, related question. Um, how, what kinds of sensors do you think, uh, in what sensor domains do, does TCP make sense? Particularly because um, if you consider, I mean, we, there's a sweet spot, right? If, it duties, if the duty cycle is too heavy, if it's very rare transmissions, this, the, between yesterday and today, your network state is completely different, so TCP doesn't make sense there. So what is that sweet spot? What data rate, at what data rate does this make sense? So, um, so, so again, I, wa I want to refer to the whole batching argument in the sense that regardless of whatever data rate you're using to sample your data, right, the most economical thing in terms of energy is to have always send it in batches. Once you do that, then all your flows kind of look the same, right? Um, it is true that maybe if you're sensing extremely rarely or something, and th then the timeliness factor becomes an issue if you're waiting for a large batch to accumulate. So, so maybe there is kind of a lower bound in that sense on how rarely, in the sense that if you, maybe if you're sensing really, really rarely, then maybe TCP wouldn't make as much sense. But we think that, uh, especially if you look at the kind of applications you see in indoor environments, right, where, where maybe sensing once per second is, is faster than most applications, but even if you're sensing once every 10 seconds or once every minute or so, um, even in those cases, it's not, um, even in those cases, waiting for a batch to accumulate might be the right thing to do if you want to get good energy consumption, in which case using TCP is comparable to other protocols. Okay. To do if you want to get good energy consumption, in which case using TCP is comparable to other protocols. Okay, Thanks. great. Um, so we're short on time, so maybe we can take the rest of the questions offline. Okay. Let's thank the speaker. <clears throat>